All right, folks. Um, well, welcome to today's conversation. My name is Patrick Mullins. I'm the Director of Public Works at Virginia Stage Company. And um, we're honored to um, have you all here today. Uh, we will uh, ask you to um, agree with us about a few things, make a few agreements as we jump into today's meeting. And the first one is if you could all check your microphone and make sure it is muted um, and keep it muted at all times for this level of Zoom. Otherwise, if I find you out, out if, and you don't realize that I can shut you off, but if you could keep your mic muted at all times. Um, the second thing is it is a live Zoom cast and uh, glitches happen. And if that happens, just take it as a moment for reflection and, uh, and take a deep breath and, um, and we'll resume as soon as we can fix whatever the technicality is. Uh, the chat window is the way we will be facilitating conversation during the, the, the call. Um, there are already about 60 or 70 of us and that will continue to grow. So, um, so please, in fact, I'm just checking that now. So please um, um, do use that and uh, Terrence will be helping us facilitate a Q&A toward the end. So if you have big questions, let's save them to the end. Um, Thank you again so much for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over to Terrence Affer Anderson. Uh, if you don't know Terrence, uh, he's the chair of the Norfolk Commission on the Arts and Humanities. He's an actor, a playwright, a producer, and the CEO of TerraVision Entertainment Network, and an all-around pretty amazing human. Um, uh, if you've been in Hampton Roads for any period of time, you know that Terrence's craft and his heart are both legendary and the body of work that he shared with this region and the number of lives he's impacted through his work and through his artistic practice is far shorter than I have time to share today. So Terrence, I'm gonna hand it over to you um, to introduce our panelists and take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, man, you humble me with that, that introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for uh, joining us today. This is a, a singular moment in American history and uh, I think that uh, artists always play an incredible role in, uh, in disseminating messages at times like these. Uh, again, I want to thank you, Patrick, and I also want to thank uh, uh, Philip Adango, the Community Engagement Co Coordinator at the Virginia Stage Company. Um, again, guys, and I don't have to tell you what's going on. There's a lot going on. There, is, uh, uh, there are protests that are happening to the degree that I've not seen before, and understand that I am a child of the, uh, the 50s and the 60s, and I have seen protests. Uh, as a result of this assassination of uh, people like uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Kennedy and Robert Kennedy and John Kennedy and, and Malcolm X and so forth. Uh, but this is something new that is happening. And, and I think that these are the type of times that, um, that is so very important to hear the artist's voice because the artist uh, transfers and transmits a lot of, a lot of the emotions, a lot of the, the, the psychological thinking, the, the social attitudes. Uh, that people are contemplating and, and, and doing and going through now, as well as the, the emotional torment. So again, uh, I give you all applause for joining us for this important conversation. And before we get started, what I'd like to do is to uh, take a moment uh, to remember those people, those African-American people that have died at the hands of, uh, of police uh, across the nation. Um, and it will be a moment of silence, and I would ask you, please, to be silent while I read these names. And uh, it's not a complete list, um, but you are sure to hear names that you've not heard before, uh, people who have died at the hands of police across the country. Of course, there's Mr. Eric Garner, Izell Ford, Michelle Cousseau, Tanisha Anderson, Tamir Rice, Natasha McKenna, Michelle Shirley, Riddell Jones, Kenny Watkins, Walter Scott, Betty Jones, Jamar Clark, Stefan Clark, Laquan McDonald, Philando Castile, Botham Jean, Dejan Jean, Sean Reed, Atania Jefferson, Eric Reason, Dominique Clayton, Brianna Taylor, Amon Arbery, who was killed by an ex-police officer and his son. Trayvon Martin, who was killed by a policeman wannabe. Michael Brown, and of course, George Floyd. Uh, all of these names 
they 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 kind of like step between our heartbeats as we think about the the tragic ways that they have have died and what we like to do now is to have a uh, some poetry read by Tiffany Sawyer with uh, Teens with a Purpose. And then after that, I'm going to introduce the panelists and read their bios. Uh, Ms. Sawyer. Yes. Uh, you have a poem that you're going to read for us? Mm-hmm. And now is your time, my dear. Take the stage. Asthma, written after Kamal. Ever since I was four years old, I was diagnosed with asthma. Lungs inflamed, heartbeat stopped, eyelids closed, but all I could see was the light. For those of you who don't know what asthma is, Asthma is a disease that is held in the airways that transport air to the lungs. Symptoms of this disease include chest pain, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, a constant fatigue. Treatment for this disease is albuterol, which is also known as a rescue inhaler. But what am I supposed to do when my asthma isn't the thing causing my chest to hurt? Well, my asthma isn't the thing taking the breath out of my lungs. When someone else is absorbing all the oxygen, forcing a lot of people to gasp for air. <gasps> Every time someone jokes about rape, a little girl cannot breathe. Every time someone says all foreign people are criminals, an immigrant cannot breathe. Every time someone says racism does not still exist, a black person cannot breathe. Welcome to America, the most asthmatic arrangement there is. Land of the free, but they never tell you that everything comes at a price. Seventh richest country in the world, but they can't seem to find the right inhaler to heal their system. Every 92 seconds, another American is sexually assaulted. America says it could take up to two years to identify thousands of separated immigrant families. The leading cause for young black men in America is getting shot by the police. There are 7 billion people in this world. 250 million people have been diagnosed with asthma, but there are 7 billion people in this world who have asthma that they were not diagnosed with. Symptoms of living in this world include chest pain, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, a constant fatigue. There is no treatment. We're all just suffering. And I'm just wondering what I can do to help change the place that I live in. Help change the fact that we can't even go one day without someone having to take an inhaler. And I'm just curious to how there are still people out there who are delirious to this disease that everybody has. And I wonder, how much more time do I have to keep fighting for what's right? How much more time do I have to keep telling these stories? How much more time do I have to keep fighting for what I believe in? I realize it doesn't matter because I will keep telling these stories and I will keep fighting for what's right until my lungs collapse again. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so very much, Tiffany. Thank you, thank you. I have my rescue inhaler in my medicine cabinet now. Asthma is something that has run in my family. Uh, and certainly, we've uh, I had found ourselves having to navigate socially induced asthma. Um, mm -hmm. So, the ladies and gentlemen, I'd like uh, to introduce our distinguished panel. Uh, we have some very noteworthy people that are joining us this evening. And I will begin with Mr. Tommy Coleman. Mr. Mr. Coleman is an actor. Uh, they're very well said. Again, thank you for joining us. Mr. Coleman is an actor and voiceover artist and the former director of the Virginia Stage Company, Urban Theater, uh, the, line art, the Line Art for Social Change, a project geared towards deconstructing racial and economic boundaries in Hampton Roads in response to the shootings of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. He is also the co-founder of the Solid Mal, a community group geared toward protesting extrajudicial justice by police. Extrajudicial justice. Uh, that's, I, I like the way you coined that word, so, sir. Uh, his, his uh, website address is TommyColeman, 
T-O-M-M-Y-C-O-L-E-M-A-N dot net. Uh, next up is a dear friend, Deirdre Love. Uh, affectionately known as Mama D, Miss Love as a poet, artifice, and the founder of and CEO of Teams with a Purpose. Miss Love is the curator of expressive arts programming for youth, for self-discovery, resiliency, or change, activities that support intellectual, social, and emotional development. Miss Love is a matriarch of a community within their organization, Teams with a Purpose, that creates a safe space and platform for young people to use their voice creativity, reflection, and action to affect personal growth that impact their peers and help transform their communities. Deirdre Love is a Public Works Virginia community partner. Uh, and what the website for Teams with the Purpose is twpthemovement.org. Uh, you can reach them at hashtag I want to live. Uh, website address on YouTube is uh, G-N-V-O-E-Z-O-N-T-L-G. TLG, you will get all of these websites on the, you can find them all on the website for this event. Uh, Kai B. White. Ms. White is the co-founder of Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, BIPOC, performs in Hampton Rose, a Facebook page that I'm a member of, a Facebook group, a group created to be a sounding board and platform for all BIPOC members across Hampton Rose to share their story and enrich the theater community through support information and accountability. Ms. White is an actor singer. She appeared in the Virginia States Company's The Wiz and also in the Disney Cruise Ship Fantasy. Ms. White, Kai B. White. Uh, her uh, website address is K-I-E-B-W-H-I-T-E dot com. Uh, again, you can uh, find that website address on the Facebook page for this event. Another dear friend, Ms. Leroy Batsfield. Mrs. Batsfield is an actor and the artistic director, owner at Iron Street Productions. Uh, productions include Pearly, the 1961 musical by Odessa, uh, Ossie Davis, satirizing racial stereotypes, Before It Hits Home, a play about the impact of AIDS on an African-American family, and August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, exploring the exploitation of black artists by white producers in the 1920s. And another difference, I have a lot of feelings, guys, uh, Miss Brittany S. Harris. Miss Harris is a creator of The Intersection, the Sandra Bland Project. Ms. Harris is an assistant professor of theater at Old Dominion University. Her specialty is race performance, activist theater, and youth-based cultural enrichment, enrichment programming. Uh, her website is BrittanySHarris.com. And finally, two more friends. Corey, the talented blind guy, and Laprida Marie Staten. Mr. and Mrs. Staten are the founders of La Tumpon Edutainment. They provide affordable and accessible opportunities for artist development on on stage and behind the scenes talents through the arts, education, professional performances, special projects and community events. A Tumpon Entertainment is Public Works Virginia Community Partner. It is a Public Works Virginia Community Partner and their website site, atumpondentertainment.com is also available on the Facebook event page. So guys, uh, to all the panelists, thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have some quite engaging conversation. I can't wait to get uh, into it. And so I'm going to start with um, Q with some questions for you. And I, I can direct them to you individually if you like. Uh, but let me start off by just asking a question. If you feel like you want to chime in, go right ahead, okay? Uh, I think that's probably going to be the best way to do this. The first question is, why is it important to you to incorporate activism in your work? Any takers on that question? Mm. I'll take it. I'll okay. take it. That that's um that's a no brainer for me because our our work is artivism. There's no separation between the activist work and the artist work that we do. Um, from the beginning of the organization, we started working to change the impact of HIV AIDS on young people using the arts as a vehicle to help change and activate changes in the way people lived and the way systems looked at people and the way people were treated and right up until today. So for me and for the work that I do, um, it's, you know, that was foundational. It, our organization was formed 
to use art as a vehicle to affect change. Uh, very nice. Anyone else care to comment, Ms. Harris? Yeah, I was going Brittany? to say um, with Deirdre, my work is very similar to that. Um, uh, my work is using the arts as a platform to amplify the voice of an artist, um, sometimes giving a platform um, to process certain things. So a lot of my work falls under the umbrella of activist theater. So how can we use the stage to amplify certain voices that just happen in corridors on forums online or conversations with your friends, but how can we use the stage to amplify that? So I can't really separate the two from my work, but I have noticed that my work for me has been therapeutic, not therapy, but therapeutic in the way that I can process um, a lot of the visual stimuli that I get from on TV, on, on our social media networks, and particularly for that millennial mind of how do I extend beyond just typing this black and white, but how can I amplify that voice to that? So it's not really a separation um, of that for me. So it's kind of imperative that my work speaks to a larger cause rather than just being purely for entertainment. And, and you find your work as therapeutic for you. Uh, have you gotten feedback from actors or performers that they similarly found it therapeutic? Yeah, um, especially for my umbrella of solo performance work. So I lead a workshop um, called Flying Solo, and it's your story in uh, the solo exploration. So giving someone that space to, in a safe space, um, the safe space of the stage, right? You're set here to either speak something aloud or have someone watch you. It's, it's that kind of dialogue, if you will, between you and the audience. And with that, um, it takes away the, the kind of formality. I feel like you have to have everything prepared and together. But in that, it does create that dialogue. Because sometimes they feel as though we're not being heard or whatnot. And this work can be therapeutic in the sense that it connects you with other people. Uh, it connects you with yourself. And then my work always lends to a reflection period. So it's kind of in that process. I see. Uh, Tommy, you do a, a lot of work that, uh, that touches upon activism. Uh, you have any thoughts on, on how you found yourself doing uh, activist work, why that's important? Yeah, um, for me, um, I guess to answer that previous question about why is it important, um, I think that being a black body on stage is activism in and of itself. Um, so right. like, it's not that I necessarily seek to incorporate it intentionally, um, but I'm just trying to merely like elevate whatever it is that I already represent to an audience. Um, and I guess, you know, if I'm trying to counteract the expectations and the preconceived notions of blackness, um, that is my that's like a supplemental reason for me doing what I do um, when, and incorporating activism into my work. I see. I see. Very nice. Uh, anyone else care to chime in on uh, on that particular question? Why is it important for you to do activism in your work? Sure. We'll uh, we'll go ahead and speak up if that's all right with you, Terrence. Oh, go right ahead, please. You know. Uh, for 23, almost 23 years now, we've been doing this work and we started as, um, you know, just arts and activism, <laughs> you know, those two things where we wanted to, from a historical perspective, present history as an art form, not just uh, in the same way that you have some of these other artists, Shakespeare was presenting his work as an art form. So we wanted to present our work, but um, with that, even with that, we also wanted to present our work um, that represents everyone, you know, so that it's historically based, it's unbiased, so that some of the things when we cross reference um, historical events, some of those things that were left out, we realized they had to be presented. Um, there were stories that were untold, there were partial stories, and so we, we've always believed it was in, important from that perspective, from a historical perspective, from an accuracy perspective, and you know, history is is a lot of where our work is rooted. I think that it's important for arts to include activism for our, our art to include activism because of cognitive dissonance. And basically, what that means is people can look at something and see themselves in it, but don't feel accused as part of the process. And I think that's what the wonderful the wonderful thing about the arts is because you have that vehicle where you can go up and say, say some really strong and poignant points, but the person 
they are not going to feel personally offended, but they can still walk away and learn. And like uh, Brittany said, is that it gives the opportunity for dialogue. And you know, we've seen it. You know, and, and especially when we get in front of audiences that are great diversity, because we perform in front of audiences that come from some places in America out west where they don't get to see artists who are black or it's black people on a regular basis. So we take that time to actually inform and educate through the stories, the music, the dance, and to give those cultural lessons and those social lessons to teach some of the tough topics that, like Brittany, Brittany said, if you want to have a formal presentation, either A, you're going to have to very much be very prepared, then B, the audience might not show up or might not be receptive. But as an artist, you have that audience, they're pretty captive. So that's the perfect moment to use your uh, talents to make an activist statement. Can I, you know, this uh, can I Terrence, can I get it? Mm -hmm. I wanted to follow up on what I wanted to follow up on what Tommy said about being a black body on a stage is activism within itself. Um, that's kind of always been my thing. So I really believe that representation matters. Mm -hmm. Our stories matter. Our points of views and perceptions matter, and our access to be able to express that matters. Um, I think that it's real important that. Um, we, we use our art in an activist sort of format. You know, it's not just about doing the Black show, because the thing is, that Black show has a story and a historical pers uh, perspective, and it has an emotional perspective, and all of those other things that, you know, just to, to get us in the limelight is activism within itself. I, I'm, I'm sure... I could go on about this for a minute, so I'm, I'm gonna keep it brief. But again, I think us being on the stage, in the spotlight, front and center, embracing our art, our version, our storytelling is activism. And especially uh, given that we, we don't have a lot of houses and things here in the 757 that belong to us. So every time we have this opportunity, it is in and of itself activism. Uh, very well stated. I appreciate your comments. Uh, is Kai still with us? Yes, I was listening. Uh, um, I have a slightly different perspective just because it's sort of new to me. Um, thinking about it, honestly, uh, it it um, is something that uh, I am taking steps to do better and understand like what I can personally do. Um, and I know that's getting into your next question, so I don't want to like step on that. But if you want me to speak on it, I can. Uh, please. Uh, the, the next question, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, if you can have some examples of your work. And I know uh, some of you um, have uh, bought something that, uh, that we can share with our viewers. Um, but uh, give us an example of your work. Would, would you, Ty? Um, so n not like an actual like physical example, but um, what, I, what I've been doing recently is revamping my personal book, my audition book. And I've been told for so long, like, you can't have this in your book. You'll never play this. You'll never play that. And I think my job as an actor, especially a Black actress right now, is to put whatever I want in my book. Absolutely. To sing whatever <laughs> I want, to put whatever pieces I want, and to own that, and to constantly remind myself that it is absolutely okay, that I can do whatever I want in an audition room. And I, I, I need to sort of reteach myself how to audition without that backlash, which is, it's, it honestly, I thought it would be a lot easier to brush off, but I find myself being like, oh, I can't sing that. There's no way. And then I'm like, no, you absolutely can. And you should, and you will. And it's something that I'm dealing with a lot, but I think that's my form um, of activism that I can show producers and casting directors that like, they're going to get, you need, you need to get used to seeing people that look like me singing songs like this. And yes. that's just what's going to happen. Yep. Uh, Non-traditional casting is something that uh, that can a lot more can be done of that. Um, and you know, I've had uh, people. And I, I put this on the uh, the BFPLC Facebook page that uh, in an audition, I've had someone ask me if I could sound more black. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's always yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, um, but my favorite so one is can you sass it up a little bit? Oh yes, they love that. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's sad. It's, it's really sad that, uh, you know, people want uh, us to portray stereotypes and we have to uh, rebel against that. 
Um, the next question is uh, if you have some examples of, of how you've uh, in, in incorporated activism into your work. And uh, uh, Corey and Laquita, I understand you guys have a video. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, we do have a video clip that we're going to show from a production that we've done several times. And it, it involves our signature piece, which is a song, Boyaya, that comes from the Ghanaian language, which means we are going. And we did this piece because, you know, we, we, our, we, we task ourselves with teaching history through the arts. And sometimes history gets a little whitewashed and watered down. People don't want to see the tough, the, the, the tough and the dark side of American history. So we use this piece, this is an example of how we use this piece in a theatrical setting to illustrate the impact of slavery on the uh, continued op oppression of African-Americans, starting not just with slavery, but starting with how Africans were removed from their land and they made property and how that just was the, the jumping off point for the oppression that we continue to see today. I'm gonna take the brief, uh, start. Well, let's, let's take a... Uh... Let's take a look at a bit of this. Uh, are you ready? So, um, no, actually, I just wanted to read this so that you guys understand where we are in this clip. Uh, the video clip starts with Africans on a ship. They are singing Wo Ya Ya, which means we are going to, exp to express their uncertainty of the situation that they're in. And this piece, it's only two minutes long. It ends with slave raiders removing the Africans from the ship as they call the names of several Southern slave holdings it's um, really emotional, but we feel it was beautifully done, and it's just two minutes in a two-hour show. We're ready. Okay, let's go for it. Several times, right? 
Yes, we've done this in several reiterations uh, on stage and stage play productions. We've used it at the 16 and 19 uh, commemorations at Jamestown and other places. So we've used this because it, like I said, it bears the mind the question, where are we going? And especially even today, where are we going now? Thinking about this whole situation with the police brutality, but you got to understand where you came from and the whole systematic uh, oppression that we face today is just a symptom, a remaining symptom of what happens when a group of people thinks that it's okay to go to another land, take people from their homes, take their language, their religion, all those things, and then enslave them. And then to keep that, that labor force going after quote unquote freedom came. And that labor force being, um, you know, just the unfair practices that we've experienced as um, not just as artists, but of course, as black people in America through the Jim Crow laws and moving share cropping, share cropping chain gangs, prison, and all, farms. prison farms, and all of that was, uh, that spans the depth of that particular production, all of those things we just mentioned. Whoa, well, yeah, yeah, we are going is the one statement piece that we have used in several productions, just to start the conversation of where are we going? How can we as individuals change whatever narrative we're in so that's that's our perspective and kudos to the actors and the actresses that pulled that off because that's a tough moment an emotional moment but they got through it there were history teachers there there were other professionals that were there school teachers that were there all as actors all as actors and they really pulled the emotion out of that so kudos to all the actors that were in that yes but just just from watching it you can see how powerful it must have been to the people portraying those those uh, those characters as well. Uh, kudos to kudos to you guys. Um, about folks that are watching, I, I noticed that there are a number of uh, comments that are appearing in the uh, in the chat room. Uh, we are going to do a Q and A a little bit later, uh, so I just ask that you just please bear with us so we can get to these uh, these questions with the panelists. Um, but that said, are there any other uh, people amongst the panelists? Uh, that would like to talk about an example of their work uh, that has uh, incorporated activism. I have a sample you, you, of the oh, Okay, I'll sit back. Go right ahead. No, I have a sample, I think uh, Patrick can queue up, of one of our poets. We did a poetry workshop at a juvenile detention center. The topic was um, reimagining high school and we brought the voice of a young person who was incarcerated out to be heard so one of our poets is going to recite a piece that was actually written in the detention center uh. And it was a part of a national initiative. My name is Chosen and I'm 15 years old and I'm representing Teens with a Purpose. There's still time. The blood, sweat, and tears, and the green, and the land. We walk on the color of our skin. They label us as gang members, young and black. But we're trying to do right. Looking for work, thinking about our future, what we want to be in life. There's still time. If I was given more positive reinforcement, then I wouldn't be bored trying to do right. My head was stuck in the drugs, the money, and fines. Stuff I wish I could rewind. Judges, police, and commonwealth charging me as an adult. I'd probably go to the Division of Juvenile Justice, more like the Juvenile Jungle, heading up the road. Now I'm locked up, my family has no home, and they in the struggle, and hoping that they can look me in my eyes. There's still time, I'm trying to do right. Well, um, Deja, I certainly uh, remember Chosen. Uh, you do such great work with uh, teens with a purpose. Uh, and you, you provide those kids with a, uh, not just a platform to speak, but you give them the, the education and the training that they need to, uh, to, to make that happen, to do those types of performances. And uh, as I said to uh, Corey and Laquita uh, and, and all of you two days for, for the work that you're doing in the community, um, teens with a purpose, the movement. 
<laughs> yeah, something else you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, the way our work evolves into what it is, is that we have the opportunity to go into the prison system to do a writing workshop. The young people really were, they couldn't believe that we were actually going to take their voice out. They were thrilled to know that it was part of a national collective of young people saying what they needed from the school system. So they knew their voice would be heard, but that would be heard on a, on a global stage where they could actually affect change. And we took it to Booker T. Washington High School. And we did a teen town hall where there were politicians and school board members, teachers, parents, the cameras from Brave New Voices that created the big documentary that, so it, so it had an impact on juvenile justice reform, school <laughs> reform, and so many other things, but mainly for us, that, that young man's voice, he was empowered in that moment to know, in spite of where he was, that he could make a difference through his words, and then that chosen, a poet, was able to take what he said and present it in such a way is so, so powerful. I'm sure it was quite a transformative experience. Um, does anyone else have any uh, examples of their work they would like to share? Uh, if not, I can move on to the next question. I could. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead Tom. I was gonna say I don't have anything to share particularly, but I can like briefly describe uh, some of the things that we I was doing when I was in Hampton Roads, um, working for Virginia Stage Company, um, and also like overseas as well because um, I've been fortunate enough to be overseas. So um, before I left the Virginia Stage Company, one of the uh, things that I was able to do with my partner, uh, Kat Martin, who also used to work there as well, we co-produced and we co-directed The Line, Art for Social Change, which was an interactive community forum that included dance, uh, poetry, and then it also used excerpts from James Baldwin's Blues for uh, Mr. Charlie to discuss redlining mm. and prejudices in the Hampton Roads area. Um, we worked very closely with Virginia Centers of Inclusive Communities. Uh, which is a fantastic resource if anybody in Hampton Roads needs them for uh, people facilitating those difficult conversations. Um, when I lived in London, it is going to sound something like something small, but it was actually, the more I think about it, the more gargantuan it was. Uh, when I originated the role of um, Dionysus in The Lightning Child, um, I made sure to show up as my full, unadulterated, unapologetic self. And by incorporating a lot of elements of Prince, Jimi Hendrix, Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, uh, tributing black exploitation, and my father even. Um, I don't think that there's been anybody on that stage who has been as black as I was on the Shakespeare's <laughs> Globe stage in London. And we even twerked on stage. So it was just like bringing those little bits of, of yourself wherever you are um, is, is part of going back to saying your black body is also um, a revolution being on stage. Uh -huh. um, sometimes uh, I'm also like very rooted in community. I'm, I love Norfolk. I love Norfolk with all my heart, even though I don't live there right now, but Norfolk is my heart and soul. And um, I remember when I worked for Virginia Stage Company, one of my first things to do was to initiate a, um, a partnership or try to get something started with Norfolk State University because my mom was an alum and um, Hampton University uh, because we hadn't incorporated those communities into, um, into Virginia Stage. So it's about trying to get in where you fit in because Activism is not just, you know, marching or, or signing petitions. It's about using the resources you have in front of you. So those are like small ways of, of, of activism and how, how I've incorporated it into my life and work. Fantastic. And you performed on stage at the Globe? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know how the trajectory of my life ended up there, but the boy from Virginia ended up on stage in London and it was it was a it was a gas. It was a it was a big beautiful thing that I can never replicate. But it was a big deal. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, there was someone else that wanted to say something. Was that Kai? Yeah, that was oh. speaking. It was Brit. <laughs> um, I was gonna just speak about uh, my work is kind of in the vein of um, something called a docudrama. So when we're talking about these these names like Sandra Bland or Karen Smith, Brianna Taylor, um, my work is pretty much making them living epitaphs. Um, so a lot of it is built on connecting with the families, connecting with resources to kind of build um, a show around it that not only uses 
my body as a vessel, but my body as a vessel to extend that narrative out. So a, a lot of my work comes down to how can we have these stories not just be black and white again. I say this a lot because I, I always talk about breathing life into the narrative. So the, the work that I created, especially with my Sandra Bland project, kind of reminds me of Kai because it came out of being in a program that was not necessarily casting me to type, but they were giving me roles that kind of let me expand and try different things, which is wonderful. But in the end, there's yeah. something about the essence of who I was as an artist that I needed. So um, yeah. I wrote that piece around the one year anniversary of her unfortunate death. And it was an extension of me. I, I kind of wrote that um, the in one side that she was being presented as a martyr, Sandra Bland, and the other she was a, a menace, but to me she was a mirror of what this unbreakable black female entity looks like. Um, not being the angry fee black female, all of that. And I was dealing with some of that um, in working with other castmates working with people in the community trying to always trying to uh, stifle my voice down so I was like a vessel to then breathe more life and amplify this voice of Sandra and I had the the honor of um allowing some of her like sorority sisters uh that she was uh, that she would knew at Perry View to read the script um when I went to go to Chicago uh to speak at MATC this past year I got to see a where I got to I wanted to see a production of um, they now have expanded her narrative into a full-blown play, but it's just amazing how we can use the stage to make sure that these voices be heard, say her name. How can we not say her name if we're not presenting it and breathing more life into it? Mm -hmm. So these stories like Brianna, she would not die with artists like us. These, these narratives that we, as an artist, we have to be a tool. We have to be a vessel for it. So my, my work kind of falls in that vein. Um, and I've, I've had the honor of uh, creating one um, about the Me Too movement as well. And uh, it's just, like I said, an extension of amplifying a voice that would sometimes go off the headlines. It's, it's done and it's swept under. But how do we continue to have this narrative, put that script out there so then it can amplify beyond just Virginia, beyond. So that's all my work. If anyone uh, watching has had any doubts uh, previously um, uh, about the power, the potency of uh, as a theater, as a voice of activism? Uh, I am sure that those uh, those thoughts, those impressions have changed. Uh, you guys are you guys are incredible. I'm, I'm honored to be able to speak with you. Um, is there anyone else that have any examples? I'm not sure that we're going to get to all the questions, but that's fine because this is this is just some very very good stuff. Uh, anyone else uh, want to talk about any examples that? Uh, Terrence. of the uh, work that, the, yeah. uh, that they've done. Terrence, I'd like to add something. Okay. So from, from what everyone is saying here, Brittany, Tommy, Deirdre, Kai, everyone that's here speaking, I think a really important part of our work, all of our work, is that this is not the scope of any of our work. It's a part of it because it has to be, but I will definitely say this is the unfortunate side is that we have to do this work because no one else is doing it and it's not going to be heard otherwise. And so in the same way that we have produced the three little pigs, we love that story. We tell it to our children. It's, we produced it as a stage play. We produced it as an audio book. However, it's not the biggest picture because this has to keep returning. This story has to keep coming back so that the actors that show themselves, like Tommy said, okay, just my presence on stage and all of his excellence is a statement because he brings his best to the stage. Corey, as a blind person, somebody that can't see, you know, that's, that's the byproduct of what people get, but they don't realize a lot of times that, okay, um, Corey's blind every day. He cannot see. He has not been able to see since... Uh, 1994. But that's not the story we tell because that's part of our personal story. But the bigger picture is like what Brittany was just speaking about with Sandra Bland. It's beyond us. And so all of us, what LaRoyce was saying, what Kai is saying, you know, this is the unfortunate part. This is why we're all here today, speaking about George Floyd's, calling out these names of people that have been taken from us. And so now it looks like we're going to have to, between timing, Deirdre, Kai, Brittany, Laquita, Corey, whoever else is on the panel. Now we got another story to tell, 
you know, because we don't know how this one will be told. And so I just want to finish that particular question with that statement, because that is what our work speaks to. That is why we do this work, because we have to tell our story. Uh, so very true, Laquita, and thank you for, for adding that. Uh, you know, that makes for a great punctuation mark for that, that particular question. Um, without naming names, and we, we've touched upon this a little bit, uh, uh, for those of you that have encountered uh, uh, challenges working with other people. And again, guys, we, we've uh, pretty much touched upon this in terms of getting your work done or opening doors. Uh, have you experienced challenges uh, that you like to cite without, again, naming names of people or organizations um, that uh, present a particular challenge of getting your work done uh, or getting you on the stage? Yes. Can I? Thank you. Um, so I won't name names, but this particular situation was um, I was auditioning for The Color Purple, and, you know, you do your prep work. I had watched the movie so I could get in the spirit. I was like, let me let me get where I need to be. I walk into the audition room the next day and the entire casting team are white males. And suddenly I didn't know how to be me. I was like trying to be this caricature of what I know that they wanted to see. And I literally had to take a step back after I left that audition. I was like, that was the worst audition I've ever been to, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I literally left and I was like, I'm black enough. I don't need to pretend to be blacker for these white men behind the panel to see something they need to see. And I don't know where in time this, this narrative of like how black women and men are, are portrayed and how they are seen because like we are black, we are black, no matter, like there's no level of blackness. And that is, that's something that needs to change completely. And um, it took me embarrassing myself in front of these these men um, to realize that, which is unfortunate, but um, it was really jarring. It totally took me off guard. Um, and it, it, I, I might have done a bit of self-sabotage reading into it when I walked in, but that was obviously not an environment that I needed to grow as an artist in because I wouldn't have. And it was just a very interesting experience, but that was one of them where I was just like, I can't believe this is my reality that there's no people of color and no women behind a table for the color purple. Like that is just the craziest thing I, I ever encountered. And, you know, obviously we've all gone through like, and I, I could speak forever on like other situations, but that particular one was just like very jarring and very eye opening for me. And I'm really glad that instead of just beating myself down, I decided I'm going to be in rooms that benefit me and my narrative. And if that is not the room for me, that is not the place I was meant to grow in. And if that works for someone else, that's great. Um, but I need to be true to myself and I need to be true to who I am at my essence. And that just wasn't it. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you, how did the, the production was eventually staged, I take it? Uh, yes. uh, any uh, word on how it went? How did it go? Over? It closed. <laughs> okay. I'm not so, surprised. Um, I don't, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> more beyond that. Uh, I had friends who were actually in it, but it, yeah, it closed ultimately, but um, for me, that initial, like, I, I will, I never want to walk into an audition for the color purple ever again, and not see women behind the table, black women behind the table, black men behind the table ever. Like that just shouldn't happen. Can I? I just wanted to add to Kai's story. What I wanted to add to Kai's story was, and what leads to that is I was in a show and I'm not going to give the title because it will give the thing away. But the thing is, we were, it was a period piece and it was an all black cast. And I remember there was some, um, excuse me, the set person was not a person of color. And there was a lot of discussion about what would be in a black home. And so these, these things are problematic uh, because like she said, you have an all white panel trying to do a black production and then you get into that situation where all of their tech people are not people of color. So you have to say, look, my, my, I grew up in a house that was in this time period and I know what my grandmother would have had in her house. 
and it would not have been this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's that's why, um, again, I think every time we are in these situations, it's an activist sort of a moment because you have to stop with your, your creative thing to kind of do the whole history lesson, the whole educating thing, the whole why we wouldn't have used it or, you know, yeah. because it wasn't available to us or exactly. those types of things or why we wouldn't wear those particular clothes or, you know, what would be in a black kitchen. I mean, these, these, and these are all little, they might seem like little things to other people, but they, they are part of our heritage and they are important to our performance because you can't be this thing that you need to be if all of your surroundings don't match that. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in on that um, from a, from an international Please. perspective? Please. Um, so I, I, there's a part of me right now that does not like relaying these awful stories about like these bad experiences that we have as like people of color in the United States and everywhere else. But the thing is living abroad, I realize that anti-blackness is worldwide, not just stateside. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was overseas there, and I don't talk about this production a lot because I left the production while the production was going on. That was very much um, my rebellion and also my activism at play there. I was doing a piece called Six Rounds. It was an American piece. Um, but it was being produced by an Indian director who, because she was brown, I was like, oh, you know, great. We understand. I, I was assuming that we'd all understood the same sort of oppression. Um, I had a very wonky audition scenario where I did an audition to her and she went and she spoke to somebody at the door the whole time I was doing my audition. Did not pay attention to me once, but she cast me in the show because I was the only American who knew what they were talking about. Once we got in the room, I'm having arguments with her about Americanisms and things that mean certain things. And instead of her asking me, she's, she cuts a script. She does not consult the writer who lives in America. Um, there was a big moment where I, I felt like I was yelling the entire time. And I'm like, this is not like, black people are not yelling all the time to get their point across. Like she, and she's like, I'm not asking you to yell, but I'm like, but no, but you've been having me do this for all these rehearsals. But long story short, I had an argument with her and she didn't want to hear it. And it was just a very interesting situation. But when she cast um, an African Orisha, Alegba, as a white male, red flag, red flag, red flag. Wow. No, 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 no. So we did the show. It opened. Two of the lead actors left because they were just like, this is not it. This is not what we signed up for. We feel like we're playing stereotypes. I luckily didn't feel I was playing a stereotype. But I realized that this woman did not care about blackness. She cared about putting up a show um for her own personal reasons and it was it was it was becoming exploitative so just letting you all know it doesn't just necessarily happen in the united states it happens everywhere it happens abroad there's a there is an image that we have of us and it was the reason why i vowed never in my life to um go into some scenarios without asking what the mission of the company is and mm -hmm. also to um just i need to figure out what people are and also um having a com having a longer conversation with these people about things they believe in. And if I believe at any point that I'm about to be exploited, um, I, I'm walking. It's not worth it for me to be on the stage and regret being on the stage to tell a story if I can't tell the story in the most authentic way possible. Yes. Uh, nicely stated, sir. And that, that is an eye opening thing on show for a lot of people. Uh, is there anyone else who wanted to make a comment? Because I, I like to move on. We have several other questions here. That we, I guess we won't get to everything, but uh, I have a question that uh, is probably going to sound a little weird, but uh, you've probably had an opportunity to prepare for it as well. But do you vote? If so, why? If you do not vote, why not? Um, Terrence, can I speak? Please. All right. So actually, this it goes back to the last question because, um, yeah, there's so much that's a loaded question about the discrepancy or the discrimination within the art space for people of color, Black people specifically, myself and Corey. We've done all of our work, almost all of it, uh, producing our, it ourselves or producing it in theaters in the area. And we have had just pretty much blatantly open discriminatory uh, acts against us where we just ignored it to get through the production, you know, and this is from several different theaters, um, not BSC, not, and I'm not saying it's not Virginia Stage Company simply because they have this platform here today, but honestly speaking, 
so far, you know, that's been one of the places where we haven't experienced that yet. Not to say that we will, but just to say that some of the other theaters, yes, we've had situations where, uh, to answer the question that we're on, first of all, we are both voters. We vote because it's our, uh, it's our privilege, it's our right, it's, um, you know, it's something that we can do to at least speak up. But specifically in theaters, we produce our own production every year. We produce a Kwanzaa, it's a stage play. It's a full-fledged stage play, lights, scripts, whatever. We had a local theater ask us to give them a show for their February show. We said, sure, we'll bring you our Kwanzaa stage play. And what was said to our faces was, oh good, but it will be even better because it'll be at our theater. So, what? absolutely. So mind you, we directed, we did the choreography, we provided the costumes, the, the script, because Corey, the, the Corey is the writer. We, we had to provide the set because even though we were housed where they housed their set, they told us they didn't have platforms. We rented out of our budget, U-Haul to transport a set over there. And then when we were finding ways to get spots, they, they, were, they went on into their warehouse, which was in the same building as us because they had a new building downtown, but I can't say their name, so I won't. So, <laughs> so, my, I point, who could that be. so my point <laughs> is that, you know, that was one. We had another group where they asked us to direct a racially charged show that they had selected. So we were like, okay, we got this. We looked at the script, we did the casting, we did two months of rehearsal, we uh, realized that the set that they were using before in the show that they produced before this show that we were now directing and everything, they pretty much stripped it and said, oh, uh, this is all we have now. Sort of like in the clip that you just saw where there was a bare bones set, um, but every other show that that particular theater produced has a full fledged immaculate set. So we were like, okay, no problem. We can do black box. And anyways, this particular theater, after we had come up with, okay, we don't have a set, but we'll costume it, we'll direct it, we'll bring in our choreographer, we'll do everything. Uh, they were, there was constant sabotage. They came in at the very end and tried to find a way to make it look as though it was their work. And so we've had quite a few experiences. However, we persevere because we know the work needs to be done. What else can we do other than use these platforms for activism, you know, and our perseverance is a form of activism. And like Tommy, we wound up uh, setting up the show and after the first week of production, we left all of our things there as far as the set, the props, the costumes. However, we couldn't return because of the animosity that was given to us by the um, directors of that theater underneath. But. Did you want to say anything add to why we vote for it? Yeah, I think all and what Laquita's talking about, it kind of stems from the social environment that we live in, which is there's a wealth gap. And there's a wealth gap in the uh, in, in society as a whole. And that same wealth gap manifests itself in the world of arts. Just being honest, as uh, as black theater producers, we we they we were told we have access to the same type of funding opportunities, but realistically we don't. And it's just being honest. And like I said, there have been times like these same instances where we've actually had the theater companies um, get grant funding to do our production, but then, like she said, we get we get you know, we don't get that type we don't we don't see those funds, but it's, we see the funds being diverted from other places. So, so there are other shows. So what we say to that is, as far as voting, I think it's important that we vote because that's the only way that we can actually get out there and make our make our uh, make our choices heard now, make our voices heard, we have to vote to get those councilmen, to get those mayors, to get those those individuals that look like us or that think like us into those seats so that we can address the wealth gap in society, which will eventually make its way into the wealth gap that we experience in parties. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very good point. I, I appreciate you making that connection. Uh, anyone else on uh, thoughts on uh, voting and or not voting uh, and why in either case? Um, I'd, I'd uh, like to gonna... say something about it. Go right ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I vote. It's a form of, of activism, but I that that I really want to um, 
respond to what was just said about, um, well, Corey talked about the wealth gap being part of the issue. And I see another, um, I see part of the issue at being, being an artist and living in America today and, and doing the work that we do is a lot of times we are, it's like, here's a gift for you. Here's an opportunity. I hear that word quite often. Here's an opportunity for you. And someone considers themselves making space for the work that we do to be seen. Um, and that the response should be, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for making space for me. But at the same time, like producing the show and not getting up, you know, that you mentioned and not getting a, 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 the equal amount of, of funding that, that came into to them for what, for the work you did to say, here's a stage, here's a space for you to show your talent and, and, and have youth voice heard, but you don't consider that it took artists, teaching artists, professionals to prepare them. It took days and weeks to work on this. This is, this is not just a song and a dance, but it's a part of who I am. Uh, there's so much to what we bring to a space or to say, um, well, this is really an important moment and we need to tell this story. And so I'm gonna bring this department and that department and that department in and all you have to do is get people from the community to come in and we're gonna give them an opportunity to be heard and seen. But I say everybody in the cast pays rent, eats food, and would there be a show if I didn't bring the people from the community to tell their story and present this? And so, I, and, and I think I love this moment because we're talking about it and people can hear that you may have thought little of that or you may not have fully processed what you just said is not just the insult but it's is uh it's degrading on levels it's saying that i'm not fully bringing anything you can't create a story of me without asking me who i am without asking me to share all of this my talent my truth but monetarily i don't have to be valued at the same level or you see it as I gave you an I gave right. you an opportunity, and not that I shared myself with you. I'm I'm as valuable as you are, and recognize me that way, and reciprocate that way. So, yeah, voting to me is is activism work, and doing the work that we do, whether we do it for activism or not, we're like we have no choice. <laughs> but to be that. And I'm so, so glad for the different people in this space to hear our hearts, even though we're going off your question. Thank yeah, you, Lucia, for that. Yeah, but because, yeah, it's that's fine. some of the things we wanted to talk about. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely fine. I'm glad that uh, that we that we uh, took a, a, a brief detour, but you know, you all brought it right back to center on that whole issue. Uh, we're going to run out of time shortly, and I want to make sure we get an opportunity for for uh, our viewers, people that are joining us, to uh, to get to some of the questions that they have. Um, but I want to ask you one last question, and then I'll I'll ask you this: you have a little bit more information about uh, uh, about what you're doing. Um, has either of you, uh, or any member of your family, had a, uh, a very alarming experience with a police officer? Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think. Tommy, you you shaking your head? What you got? I was shaking my. I'm not on my head because yes, um, yes, very much so. It's a. Uh, um, I'll try to be very brief. Um, in terms of, I've had like two, drastically different, um, encounters with police. Um, one I have. First of all, I have a lot of male um, family relatives who have been incarcerated. So one, I'm pretty sure that they have definitely had um, bad encounters with police, but. Um, haven't discussed that with me. But in Philadelphia, when I was in college, um, I remember my very first scary run-in with the cops was then. I was lucky enough 
to have my first scary experience when I was like 19, 20 years old. And um, I was driving with a friend, his taillight was out. He did not know. Uh, we were pulled over literally a block away from my house. And then there was this all this hullabaloo. Instead of just saying, your taillight is out, you need to get it fixed. It was about 45 minutes of an encounter. And then I had one of the good cops trying to tell me, it's all right, you can go home because you live around the corner. And I'm like, I'm not leaving, I'm not leaving my friend here with you all. And, I, and they were like, you don't have to be noble in this moment, you can go home. And I'm like, I am not going home and leaving my friend with you here. Um, Cause I did not know what was going to happen if my friend was out of my sight. And I remember we had to go pull over in some like parking lot that, had, that was nowhere near where my apartment was to wait for somebody to come and pick him up because they wouldn't let him drive his car home. So I don't know what that situation could have been like, but Philadelphia police are not necessarily known for having fantastic encounters with their citizens. Um, so that's one. But then I had another experience in Virginia post um, the Silent Mile, which was a big march that we had to protest um, extrajudicial violence by police. And I was embraced by the police because I was trying for the first time to see things from their perspective. And I, um, I did their virtual training that they go through and I did a ride along. And I actually did a, a, a Facebook live that was about that particular night on Ride Along. And I learned a lot. Um, and I learned a whole lot, which I'm not gonna put, I'm not gonna say here, but I did get drastically different experiences with police. Um, it does not make me favorable of, of the institution, unfortunately, because of its origins. But um, I do have, a, have more understanding for some of the individuals who decide to choose that as their line of work. Thank you for sharing that. So there was someone else that had a, a comment. Who was that? Yes. Um, so I have had a couple run-ins and I also have family that's from Baltimore city and they have had many run-ins, which I won't get into. That's their story to tell. Um, but it happens. Uh, one particular situation I had here was actually in Chesapeake. I was driving my dad's car. I was in high school and um, he has a Benz and apparently to police officers, black people shouldn't own those. And I got pulled over because they thought I stole my dad's car. And it was the weirdest thing because as a teenager, I knew something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out like what was so wrong with the situation. All I'm thinking is like, why would I steal a car? That's crazy. Um, until I got home and then I talked to my parents about it and I realized why they thought I stole the car. And I had black friends in the car with me, black men. And that was also alarming to these police officers to the point where they tried to open the back seat, no prompting. Like there was no, like I literally was, there was no issue. I had the paperwork, everything. And they tried to open the car door. They saw that we had other people in the car and they backed off. And I think about like how different that would have been. What if I was by myself? Or what if he, the cop, had more buddies with him? Like, there's just so many ways that could have ended with just a simple traffic stop. And I never thought about it then, but seeing the people that we've lost now over nothing, it shows how quickly that that situation could turn. Um, and that that is just terrifying in itself. And I consider myself a person of some privilege, which is why I can speak out about things that some of my friends and family don't feel comfortable speaking about. Um, and even that happened. So it's, it's just a really, it's a, a day by day thing when you remember things that happened that didn't seem um, bad or they didn't seem scary at the time. Um, and now you're like, that could have just been so different. Like I could have said one thing that could have possibly set that cop off. And you, you, it's just, it's a really weird, it's a, it's a weird adjustment and a growing situation for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about defunding the police and about police reform, and uh, I'm not sure what, uh, how police reform, how that might look, um, but I, I think that uh, we're certainly headed in that direction. Uh, guys, we've covered a whole lot, and there's so much more that we could uh, discuss, um, but I'd like to get to some of the, uh, the questions from our viewers. Uh, and then uh, I'll give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about how people can reach out to you and... Uh, uh, if they want to support you and, and just keep the best of what you're doing. Uh, Patrick, are you uh, ready to uh, throw some questions at us? 
Yes, sir. Uh, if folks have questions, they can drop them in the chat window. There aren't currently any, but uh, if you do have a question for the panel or uh, a comment, I know there was one here um, from Crystal saying, thank you for being so open about the discrimination. Many of us in the area have had similar stories and your words have given validation to our experience. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about the, 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 the February slot and the black play, um, which came in. Um, I see something here. What are the green flags for yep. working with organizations? I think she means what are the what are the signs that an organization is is a good organization to work with, mm. as opposed yep. to a bad one. Oh, um, I would look at. I, I don't like the term good or bad because the thing is in this world, I think it's all about what their mission is. Absolutely. Um, I. I, I don't want to call anybody out as being bad because this is the world that we live. You know, I'm an artist. I want every, all art supported. But one of the things that, and I, I, I don't want to get too long with this because I know we're running out of time. Who, who's in their leadership? If you, who's on their board? Who frequents their establishments? What, that's the stuff that you've got to kind of take into consideration because a lot of the time I feel like you know, going back to what someone said earlier, we're, we're always made to feel like we should be grateful for the opportunity yeah. or the grateful for the participation. And had I known that that's what your offer really was going to boil down to, I probably wouldn't have taken it. Yes. So now that I've been in this game a little bit of time, I really will say that until leadership gets more inclusive and more diverse, and I'm gonna add this one because I haven't thought about this in a while, younger, okay, mm -hmm. um, yeah. We, we're, I'm, not, I'm afraid there aren't any right away flags, but I, I would just take a look at the makeup of the leadership because they are the pe ones that define the mission statement. They are the ones that define what seasons look like, what roles will be available, what, um, and again, with roles, uh, that's in a whole nother conversation for a whole nother <laughs> Zoom meeting. But uh, seriously, look at the leadership. Uh, you'd be surprised. There are some very progressive people in some very great positions. But, you know, again, take a look at previous seasons, too. That's another good hint. Previous yes. seasons of work. Yeah. Well, I have something to add. Okay. Say again? We have something to add. So, okay. Uh, and I actually, go right ahead. I was just going to say, um, you know, it sounds politically correct to say, what are the green flags? We've heard of the red ones. But the fact of the matter is, we all know what the sunshine looks like. Not all of us know what to do in a tornado. Not all of us know what to do in a bad situation. So honestly speaking, I feel like instead of like trying to get back to well, what's good, who's good, and what's really out here, like that's why we're here today. Because again, we can't always do our other work. We like Shakespeare. That's one of Corey's favorite, right. or, you know, favorite writers. But we can't produce Shakespeare because we keep coming back to our story because of injustices and whatnot. And so in the same way that LaVoyce just said, you know, look at past seasons. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not. You really just have to find out what you're willing to tolerate once you get into a situation, how you can manage a situation, how you can turn a good thing into better, a bad thing into great, and all of that. Just like in any particular situation, when we walk into a Walmart, when George Floyd walked into that store that he walked into and had a good bill that they thought was bad, you know, it went a different direction. And so it's the same thing with us. When any of us artists go into a theater, we really do expect great things. We went there and accepted the offer because we thought it was a green flag. We did not expect that it was a benevolent offer to, to have exposure that, like Deirdre said, does not pay the light bills. Exposure never paid a, a food bill, a light bill, a vacation. And right. I can't eat exposure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there you go. I can't eat exposure. I love it. To me, a red, a red flag is, especially as a Black artist, yeah, we got this production we want you to do in February. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And because, then it's like, okay. Right. Because our work, our work, no matter what story we're telling, even if I had, Corey had ever written, because I don't write, he's the writer, even if he had ever written a Harriet Tubman story, we could show it in October. 
you know, why can't we show it in October? If we're looking exactly. at Moana, if we're looking at Moana in June, why can't we also look at Harriet Tubman in June? What's the difference? If it's the American history, so you know, again, our work is rooted in history for these reasons because it's a part of our heritage, but also it's a part of this ongoing situation with the Breonna Taylors, with the George Floyds mm -hmm. and whatnot. And so we get into these situations with theaters, with this, the green flag in our mind, there was a green flag because until we got there, we didn't see the red flag. So I don't really think it's so much that you can even look at a theater space and just automatically know this is going to be a grand place because we don't go into places intending to be the angry, the, the uh, you know, the disgruntled or any of that. We go in as artists. I'm sorry, Tommy. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm, so I'm here looking at the, the, the group chats too, and there's like some, some amazing questions that have just popped in. Uh, absolutely. And, um, yep. Oh, and what I wanted to go do ahead. is address like one, uh, if not two, and, and briefly, um, Martha Elder, I think you had a question that says, how can black artists reach a, a wider white audience? Um, that is not yes. a black. That's not a black problem. That's a white problem because the yes. gangs are white people. Thank you. So those are the people who are going to have to open the doors and give us the access, and not even give us the access, but pass the mic. Um, there's a really interesting thing happening on Instagram right now, where tomorrow, um, white prominent white um, women like Julia Roberts and stuff like that, they're going to be letting black women speak from their platform. And that is something that it, I just, I, like, it's so mind-blowing. I wouldn't have imagined that from back in the day. So in terms of answering that particular question, we can answer, uh, we can reach wider audiences once people um, allow us to. And mm -hmm. once they stop tokenizing us and only Thank like you. certain types of Black people should get this kind of Exactly. Kind of Amen. So there's that. And then there was a question about playwriting that I really wanted to get really qu quickly to. Oh, which, just, um, it was... How do you address oh. other? Oh, my bad. No, no, you're fine. Just before you switch to the next question, I want oh, yeah, to talk yeah. about what you just said. Oh, yeah. um, and also, Black artists oh, yeah, reaching wider audiences. We got about Okay, I'll go, go fast. Um, we need to start holding these theaters accountable, first and foremost. We need to start holding every single person accountable. If we feel like we're in an unhealthy relationship with the theater, if we feel like we're in a toxic relationship with the theater, if we feel like we're being disrespected in any way based on the color of our skin, we have to say something. And Agreed. we've been told our whole lives to just, like, I personally have been taught to make white people comfortable, which is a crazy mm. thing. But that's literally what I was told my whole life and they to never be get safe. Told the same thing for us. And right. it's never the opposite, which is exactly why it's so important, <laughs> right. especially now when we have these platforms and we have this momentum, we need to hold these people, these theaters accountable. Every time something is wrong, something in, some injustice happens, and hopefully through that, um, they will gain a, a bigger following. A lot of a Black artists aren't going to certain theaters because we know we're going to be put as made number four. And I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. Right. I'm not going to be put right. in the ensemble when I see what you're putting on your leads. I'm not. Yes. And yeah. until we change that dynamic, like it, you're just going to get a disproportionate number of people and different types of people in your theater, but that's on them. And that is yeah. not on us. Here's what I, Guys, I, I, wish we had, I wish we had more time. Uh, we're right now, we got about uh, six minutes left. Let me ask a quick question. Um, do you all mind responding to questions uh, a bit later? I don't know that we have the opportunity to ask even how to make that work. Uh, but if that were a possibility, would you mind responding to some of these questions a little later? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That, that'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Most, so what I'd like folks, to do is their uh, links are in the chat. The links are in the chat for most people's websites. Oh, yes. Please email um, me. Yes, yes. <laughs> Please. And that was what I was going to ask. If you wanted to, uh, in, clo in closing, uh, make a quick reference to what you may have coming up or just uh, contact information so people can get in touch with you if they want to support you and find out what you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, let's just start with uh, you, Tommy. Um, all right, so my name is Tommy Coleman. Um, you can go to my website, www.tommycoleman.net. Um, a lot of things, I just updated it last night. So you can find out everything you need to know. I'll be there. That's how you can also reach me if you need to email me or you can um, at Tommy Too Cool on Instagram to get a whole different version of me. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but the thing is I, I respond either way especially when it comes to art art stuff 
if you have questions about anything in the industry, feel free to ask me and I will respond. All right, Deirdre. Sure. Um, our contact is TWP the movement and TWP the movement.org is the website and that's the, our social media and everything else is always TWP the movement.org. It was really great to have this opportunity. And I hope that, I really hope that w when we said the things about um, we're not going to stand for this anymore, I want to say to the white people in the space who took the time to be, to come and hear what we had to say, it should be, I would love to see it be both ways to say we're not going to take it anymore and you're not going to take it anymore and we both have to have the courage to have the conversations the tough conversations and not look for the green light but to figure out how we're going to dismantle that that red flag and and do that together so i appreciate the opportunity thank you uh, kai your contact information and uh anything you want to add yeah, um, my contact information, my website is kybewhite.com and my Instagram is also kybewhite because it's easier to just have everything the same for me. Um, I can be reached anytime. I have a lot of free time as um, imagine a lot of us do. And um, just continue using your voices as platforms. This movement is not a fad. It is a movement. And we have to keep this momentum going. So please don't think of this as like, oh, it was last week's thing. This is every day share away educate your friends educate your families educate yourselves and that's the only way we're going to make change thank you very much thank uh LaRoyce. hi um well just to say that all the things that's been happening in the last few weeks have really kind of inspired me to be motivated again i had become very unmotivated with things around here for a while and now i am i, would, I don't want to say i'm back but i find myself with a new purpose I really look forward to working with Kai and the Black Indigenous people of color. I think it's time for us to figure out how we are going to respectfully insist on inclusion. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Brittany, are you still with us? Yeah, I still am. I am. Um, okay. so Brittany S. Harris, um, dot com, and then I am, uh, I am Brittany S. Harris on Instagram. Um, I have a couple of works coming up. I'm actually working with Deirdre and Teens with the Purpose on a summer program that's about um, amplifying the voices called Amplify and how we're using our youth voice that isn't just within their four mile radius of the St. Paul Quadrant, <laughs> but how do we extend into the, uh, the roots of Norfolk and beyond that. So I'm doing that and then I'm speaking and performing at a French festival, the Women's Theater French Festival in North Carolina, taking some of my work there. So if anyone wants to just talk about uh, the development of how to uh, create work that's based on this kind of social relevancy, um, please let me know. I would love to be an advocate for that. And like Kai said, this is not a fad. This is not just a hashtag. So let's be more right. Yeah. And uh, Kumi and Laquita. We can be contacted, you know, if you, our website is Corey, C-O-R-E-Y, Corey, the talented blind guy .com. That takes you to the homepage of Oxen Pond Edutainment. And we, right now, we have a project going on. So it's, on, it's an initiative called Blind Guy, His Wife, Their Life. It's our <laughs> YouTube channel. And, it's, <laughs> and we can be, this is a place where we can be more candid about, because we don't just address uh, racial issues. I have a double whammy because uh, with being black and being a person. It's seven o'clock. So what I would say is check that channel out, subscribe, like, hit the like button so the algorithms can grow so people can get the information about what it means to be blind here in America, how I do life with my wife as a blind person. With three children. With three children. And I also do address in our latest video, you know, my experiences with police officers before I lost my sight and how the fear that I just can't imagine being in the George Floyd situation not being able to see what's happening and, mm. and how that could just lead to some very tragic things. You know, I'm a big black guy. They don't know what I can't see. So that's something to check out. It's called Blind Guy, His Wife, Their Life. It's our YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, hit that out, hit, hit all the uh, buttons to, for the album. Bum rush the buttons is what I say. <laughs> I want to thank you all so very, very thank much. You, Terrence. Yeah, thank, you, Terrence. thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Virginia, for the opportunity. Absolutely.
Yes. yes. Um, and so, uh, Patrick, I want to turn it back over to you to close out. Sure. I just wanted to say thank you again to folks who shared so much today and from your experience and, um, and thank you to folks who came to listen. Um, right. I think that's really so much is we're in a moment that so many of us that have been so fortunate need to shut up and listen. And thank you for being here today to do that. And thank you for sharing so much today. Um, speaking of teens with a purpose, uh, we have a friend raiser with them coming up on June the 18th. Um, and you can find information from that on the virtual page and there's camps and all that other stuff too. But, um, thank you again. And, uh, and any final words from you, Terrence? I'll let you close it out. Um, well, I'm just very appreciative of having the opportunity to talk to so many uh, dear friends and to make some new friends, um, uh, particularly using uh, this, this platform to uh, engage each other in some very uh, noteworthy, worthwhile, and timely conversation. I'm just very appreciative of the, of the opportunity, and uh, thank you so very much, Patrick and Philip, for inviting me to do so. Uh, guys, I wish you Godspeed, peace, and blessings. Thank you, Terrence. Thanks, Thank Terrence. Thank you all. Same to you. Thank you, Terrence. Thank you.